Welcome to the Northwestern University Rotating Resident Curriculum in the Department of Emergency Medicine. This is the Approach to Trauma and Wound Care Lecture. The objectives of this lecture are to learn how to initiate trauma resuscitation of the injured patient, to learn basic principles of ambulatory wound care, to learn to manage simple cat and dog bites, and to learn to manage simple skin abscesses. Trauma Overview It is crucial to recognize that trauma is approached in an algorithmic fashion. The immediate life threats are addressed first. Initially, there is the primary survey, which can be remembered by the mnemonic ABCDE, which stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. The primary survey should be stopped and addressed if any portion of the survey is not intact. There are adjunctive tests to the primary survey, which occur after the primary survey, including chest x-ray, pelvis x-ray, and the fast scan of ultrasound. Vital signs are performed either during or after the primary survey, but they should never delay completion of the primary survey. The secondary survey is performed after the primary survey and the vital signs, and includes the ample history, which stands for allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal, and events immediately prior to the trauma. The secondary survey also includes the complete physical examination and any adjunctive testing. Let us now look at some of the specifics of the primary survey. First, we will discuss the airway. Clear, oriented speech is required to call an airway intact and trauma. There are certain airway maneuvers that must always be kept in mind. First, especially in blunt trauma patients, adequate C-spine precautions must always be performed. These should include the jaw thrust rather than the head tilt, chin lift maneuver, as this could further injure an unstable C-spine. A nasal or oral airway may be used to optimize bag mask ventilation. Additionally, rapid sequence intubation is the preferred method to gain control of an unintact airway. Rapid sequence intubation, or RSI, involves pre-oxygenation, sedation, paralysis, followed by intubation. After the airway evaluation, we must now assess the breathing. The clinician should listen for bilateral breath sounds. When they are decreased on one side, one must do a quick assessment of the patient's stability. If the patient is awake, alert, and talking, it is reasonable to wait for a chest x-ray to confirm decreased breath sounds on one side. If any part of the patient's stability is in question, immediate tube thoracostomy or needle thoracostomy is indicated. Additionally, the clinician should palpate the patient's chest wall to assess for any segments of step-off in the rib cage or any segments of flail chest. Pulse oximetry may simultaneously be assessed, however, as stated before, any vital sign should not delay the primary survey. After the breathing assessment, circulation should now be evaluated. First, pulses should be assessed, including in the femoral, radial regions, as well as the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibialis pulses. Heart rate and blood pressure may be checked simultaneously, but again, the vital sign should not delay the rest of the primary survey. Direct pressure should be held on any obvious external sites of bleeding. Additionally, two large bore IVs, which are 14 to 16 gauge, should be placed, ideally, in the antecubital fossae. Two liters of normal saline or lactated ringer should be started, and if the patient is still tachycardic or hypotensive, pack red blood cells should be transfused. Among blunt trauma patients, only a few areas of the body can bleed enough to cause hypotension. These include the intraperitoneal space, the retroperitoneal space, the pleural space, and the pelvis. Additionally, fractures of both femurs can cause enough blood loss to cause hypotension in the adult patient. As blood loss progresses, hemorrhagic shock will ensue. The total adult blood volume is 7% of ideal body weight, which means about 5 liters of blood in a typical 70 kilo adult. There are four general stages of hemorrhagic shock due to blood loss. Stage 1 is represented by 0-15% to of blood loss. There are no general vital sign or physical exam abnormalities. These patients will require crystalloid replacement only. Stage 2 occurs when 15-30% to of blood is lost. Tachycardia is the main physical finding seen here. These patients will also require crystalloid replacement, however, consideration should be given to blood transfusion. In stage 3 of hemorrhagic shock, 30-40% to of blood loss occurs. Here we see tachycardia, hypotension, and confusion. These patients will definitely require both crystalloid and blood replacement. Stage 4 occurs when there is an excess of greater than 40% of blood loss. Here the patients are tachycardic, hypotensive, and often comatose. Patients will require blood replacement, crystalloid replacement, and almost always aggressive interventions to stop hemorrhage. 
one can remember the stages of hemorrhagic shock by referring to the scoring seen in the game of tennis. The scoring in tennis goes love 15, 15 30, 30 40, and game. The percentages of blood loss in each stage of hemorrhagic shock follows the same pattern. After the circulation assessment comes disability. This refers to a basic neurologic exam. A gross motor and sensory exam of all extremities is performed. An evaluation of the patient's level of alertness is also performed here. This may be accomplished through the AVPU scale or the alert to verbal stimuli to painful stimuli or unresponsive or the Glasgow Coma Scale or GCS. Pupillary examination may be performed at this point or during the secondary survey. After the D for disability comes E for exposure. This refers to completely disrobing the patient. The patient should be rolled off the backboard and the backboard should be removed while the patient is maintained under spinal precautions. Rectal examination as well as examination of the entire spine should be performed. Visual inspection of the axillae and the perineum should also occur during this step for any obvious injuries. There are several adjuncts to the primary survey. Vital signs, as stated previously, although should not be delaying the primary survey, may be done at the same time if there are enough resources present. The GCS may also be performed at this time. GCS is assessed by looking at three main variables, the eye response, the verbal response, and the motor response. The highest score one can get in a GCS is 15, and the lowest one can get is a 3. The FAST scan may also be performed at this time. FAST stands for Focused Assessment of Sonogram and Trauma. It uses ultrasound technology to detect intra-abdominal and pericardial blood. However, it cannot be used to detect retroperitoneal blood. There are four views of the FAST scan, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the suprapubic, and the subxiphoid. Chest and pelvis x-rays are both used to detect major injuries in those regions. The secondary survey refers to a complete head-to-toe physical examination. This is only initiated when the primary survey and adjuncts are completed. The secondary survey is intended to detect injuries which may not be emergently life-threatening, as with the primary survey, but are still serious and must be addressed. Adjuncts to the secondary survey include CT scan, which can be used to evaluate for head, chest, abdomen, pelvis, retroperitoneal injury, and spine trauma, as well as EKG to check for blunt cardiac injury and plain films for extremity injuries. The evaluation of the C-spine deserves special mention here. In an effort to reduce unnecessary radiographs, the Nexus criteria were developed. This is a prospectively validated 34,000 plus patient study which shows 99.6% sensitivity for C-spine injury. X-rays are not necessary if all of the following conditions are met. The patient must lack midline C-spine tenderness, they must not be altered or intoxicated, there must be no distracting injury that may preclude adequate examination of the C-spine, and there must be no focal neurologic deficit. If all these conditions are met, radiographic evaluation of the C-spine is not necessary. We will now turn our attention from major trauma to simple lacerations and abscesses. The goals of wound repair include cosmesis, hemostasis, and infection prevention. The physiology of wound healing occurs at the following peak times. On the order of hours, coagulation and vasospasm occurs. In the 48-hour range, there is complete epithelialization, which means that the initial dressing may be removed at this time. Angiogenesis peaks at 4 days, and collagen formation peaks at 7 days. Wounds take about 6 months to heal completely, and even then, the tensile strength of the skin returns to only about 80% of normal. Wound healing is impaired by diabetes, steroids, sunlight, and coagulopathies. Important elements of history in wound assessment include mechanism of injury, contamination, timing of the wound, and the tetanus status of the patient. Timing of the wound is crucial. Non-facial wounds must be closed within 6 hours. Clean facial wounds can be closed if less than 24 hours have elapsed. Consider delayed primary closure if unsure about infection potential. Delayed primary closure refers to closure of the wound in a follow-up setting after the initial wound is cleansed. Tetanus immunization should be given if greater than 10 years for a clean wound and greater than 5 years have elapsed for any visibly contaminated wound. The size of the suture placed and the time to removal depends on the location of the laceration. Facial lacerations require 6O suture, which is the smallest kind easily available, and should be removed in 5 days. 
The digits require 5O suture and should be removed in 5 to 7 days. The hands 4O suture in 7 days and every other part of the body requires 3O or 4O sutures and should be removed in 10 to 14 days. Generally speaking, nylon sutures should be used externally and vicryl should be used for deep sutures. Special cases include intraoral or tongue lacerations, which require chromic gut sutures, vermilion border lacerations, which require nylon sutures but a regional nerve block so as not to distort the anatomy. Scalp lacerations require the galea to be sutured to prevent hematoma or fibrosis of the scalp. Hair may be trimmed but never shaved as this may predispose to infection. Eyebrows should never ever be shaved as 20% of the time they will not grow back. Any ear lacerations should have the cartilage covered, and this may require a pressure dressing to prevent ear hematoma. The steps before actual suturing may be even more important than the suturing itself. First, anesthesia is applied. Lidocaine 1% without epinephrine is given. A useful rule of thumb to remember the maximum dose of lidocaine 1% without epi that may be given is to take the patient's weight in kilograms and divide by 2. For example, for a 70 kilo adult, 35 mLs of 1% lidocaine without epi is the maximum dose to avoid lidocaine toxicity. If the patient is allergic to lidocaine, then procaine or tetracaine may be used, as these are ester compounds rather than lidocaine, which is an amide compound. Epinephrine may be used for the face and the scalp, except for the nose and the ears. Slow injection with a 27 gauge needle minimizes the pain on infiltration of lidocaine. After a local anesthetic is administered, irrigation is performed. Irrigation is the single most important preventive measure for infection in wounds. High pressure with saline is preferred, however, several studies have shown that tap water pressure may be acceptable for clean wounds. After irrigation, clean the wound with sterile prep. Non-ionic detergents such as SureCleanse are better than betadine. Full strength betadine, peroxide, and ionic detergents should always be avoided. Let us now discuss the evaluation of dog and cat bites. Dog and cat bites account for about 1% of all ED visits. The upper extremities are the number one site. Dog bites often cause polymicrobial infections from bacteria such as Pasteurella, Echinella, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes. The wound type of a dog bite is a tearing or crush injury. 24 hours is the median onset to wound infection in dog bites. Cat bites, on the other hand, are usually monomicrobial, caused by Pasteurella multilocida. Puncture wounds are seen more often than tearing or crush injuries. The onset to wound infection in cat bites is as little as 12 hours. The pictures on the upper left and right demonstrate cat bites. Notice the puncture wound in the center followed by erythema surrounding and a little bit of streaking seen on both sides. The bottom left two pictures indicate dog bites. Here we can see the tearing or crush lacerations that occur with dog bites. The management of cat and dog bites involves local wound care and prophylaxis of infections. Wound culture is of low yield. Antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for all cat bites and most dog bites. Only three of the commonly available oral antibiotics may be used to prophylax or treat cat and dog bite associated infection. Amoxicillin clavulinic acid, a fluoroquinolone plus clindamycin, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole plus clindamycin. It is crucial to remember that monotherapy with cephalosporins or clindamycin alone may not be used. In addition to antibiotic prophylaxis, rabies and tetanus prophylaxis should be used when indicated. Primary repair with sutures should only ever be considered for tearing dog bites to the face. Cat bites should never be sutured, and most dog bites away from the face should also not be sutured. Whereas dog and cat bite antibiotic prophylaxis is instituted for five days, actual bite-associated infection requires 10 days of antibiotic therapy. The drugs are the same exact drugs as used for prophylaxis, amoxicillin clavulinic acid, a fluoroquinolone plus clindamycin, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole plus clindamycin. When a bite is overtly infected, wound culture may be useful. Additionally, consider getting an x-ray of the affected extremity to assess for a broken tooth, especially in cat bites. Let us now discuss the evaluation and management of skin abscesses. Skin abscesses are localized pus-filled infections without frank cellulitis. The most common organism seen is Staphylococcus, far more than any other organism. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, is steadily increasing as a potential pathogen in these infections. Optimal management of skin abscesses involves incision, drainage, and potentially packing. The drainage should always be cultured to assess for MRSA. 
Once the abscess has been incised and drained, loose packing should be placed with iodoform gauze. The patient should be re-evaluated in 48 hours. If there is still purulent drainage present, they should be repacked. If there is no more purulent drainage, warm soaks may be applied. Healing occurs in around 10 days. Antibiotics should only be administered if there is an associated cellulitis present. Follow these steps when performing an incision and drainage for a skin abscess. First, always have a sterile prep of the area involved. Always wear a mask and gown with eye protection. Initial needle aspiration may be performed for culture. A linear incision is made throughout the length of the abscess. The abscess cavity is then probed with instruments to break up loculations. There is no benefit to irrigation in this step. Never ever probe with your finger as there may be sharp foreign bodies within the abscess cavity. After the pus has been drained, pack the abscess cavity with iodoform gauze. Leave at least a 1-2 to two centimeter wick at the end so that it is easy to remove the gauze on recheck. Apply an external gauze dressing for protection. In summary, maintain an algorithmic approach to trauma. Use the ABCDE mnemonic and do not move on until each step is addressed. Evaluate the C-spine in a stepwise approach with a nexus criteria. Always watch for medical illness causing traumatic injury. Medical illness such as dysrhythmia, syncope, or hypoglycemia may cause severe traumatic injuries. For wound care, never forget the timing and mechanism of injury as well as the tetanus status. And most dog bites and all cat bites require antibiotic prophylaxis. Only three oral antibiotics may be used to prophylax. Amoxicillin clavulinic acid, a fluoroquinolone plus clindamycin for staph and strep, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole plus clindamycin.